children and I reached 50 years old and had no children. I, I, I found that surprising. I had an image in high school that I'd have a wife and three kids and probably live on a golf course and have lots of friends. Instead I found myself living on a mountain with a girlfriend and no kids. And, and for years prior to that until even after 50 I felt there was something missing. Dogs are nice but I still thought maybe a kid would be kind of cool to try. And, and so I even uh, approached other women that I knew that were either had not had kids or, or had been divorced and maybe had one kid and still were interested in more kids. And I talked to some of them about co-having a kid. But that, that seemed kind of complicated. The women I talked to, well, there was a lot of interest there, but it was kind of felt like having a divorce without the marriage. Like one woman who would have been great as a mother and she was smart and educated and had one child already and wanted to have another kid, very much wanted to have one more kid, but but she outlined the arrangements was just, I would I would pay her from eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month for child support. I'd see my son or daughter every two weeks. I'd get every other weekend. That didn't feel so right either. So so I was on the computer occasionally and, and there's a lot of women on the computer that do surrogacy. Uh, they say there's hundreds of thousands of women available to do surrogacy now. So I tried that route, and I generally was rejected kind of right away because there were two problems. First of all, I'm old. <laughs> Why do you want to give somebody a kid to an old guy? And he's, he's single. He's not even a gay couple or something. I mean, <laughs> there's no redeeming value to having a kid for me that you could... I could see it. As a woman, you want to have this child for someone who seems worthy or that would be the best environment for a kid. And I, I can understand why I wasn't getting a whole lot of offers. So then out of blue, I was 51, and, and occasionally I'd surf the net or try another route, and, and the gal wrote me back and said she was very interested. And I wrote her back and said, well, come out for a visit. And, and then I looked her up on the internet, and she was a cute, blonde, 25-year-old woman getting her master's back in New Jersey. I couldn't really understand why she would want to do something like this with me. And so she flew out anyway, and I'm waiting at the airport, and I was looking around for her, and the woman coming towards me was not quite the woman, I thought. <laughs> I had seen, on, she wasn't blonde, she was more purple green. <laughs> and she had a lot of jewelry on. I mean, she had a lot of rings on her ears, a lot of... One through her lip, um, through her nose, a small bowling ball, hair, tons of it. She was kind of cool looking. I mean, this was a lot of color, a lot of stuff going on. And the one that really threw me off was a nose ring with the barbs at the end. I don't know how to get it in, I don't know how to take it off. But, and I tried to always look in her eyes when I talked to her, but guys try to look at women in their eyes. I mean, there are lots of reasons to look down. That one was like really tough. So, but anyway, Heather is her name. Turned out to be a very independent, strong willed, powerful woman who left home at 16 and had a mind very much of her own. And so we wrote up a contract and she flew home and and I went to visit her four months later. And during that four months, she got off the pill. She got a doctor. She figured out how to monitor her, what is it, when you're, when you're ovulating. Schedule. She started learning all these things and worked to deal with her boyfriend, which was a small Italian guy that made me a little nervous. But they <laughs> did some arrangement. So <laughs> hopefully end up, I wouldn't end up with a small Italian. <laughs> uh, that deal. So that, that, that and I flew back four months later and I landed in Philadelphia and I went in a car and went and picked her up and met her for the second time and we went to lunch and then drove into town to the uh, insemination clinic and there uh, I was the first one to perform. 
<laughs> I was escorted back to a, a little comfort room and had one of those examination tables, look at paper on it, and a nice fluorescent light. I thought this was a nice environment. And then I was <laughs> given my cup and given pretty explicit directions on cleanliness and, and what to get in the cup, what not to get in the cup. And, and it sounded like I thought this wouldn't be too hard, yet now I was in a position of uh, sort of performance anxiety. I mean, I never, I kind of felt by the time I was 50, I sort of, not that I was an expert in yeah. history, <laughs> but if I had all the time for 30 years, 30 years ago, and yet I never tried Ashley Amos. <laughs> actually been in a room with the white paper and, the, and then and there was a hallway just on the other side of the same door with lots of people walking and talking. And so I called up a couple buddies real quick on my cell phone to just kind of laugh about it. I called up my girlfriend, but she really wasn't very inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> and then did what I could do and and fifteen minutes later I was walking down the hall with my cup and the sweat on my brow. And I, I, I'd been okay. And then, and then it was Heather's turn. And apparently they do something with sperm and make it like, they grease it, they make some protein, and then they put it so far upper that, I don't know, I guess vaginas are not nice places for sperm. This is past that entirely. So, and then when she was done, I guess she was saying, they, and she's a very open kind of woman, she said they kind of gave her a cork. A sponge with kind of a impervious thing that they put so far up, nothing could come back down. So she was court when we drove her. Dropped her at home, got on the airplane, and flew back to Utah. Well, time passed, and and here I could never, never accidentally got someone pregnant, never intentionally got anyone pregnant, and yet one time with a cup apparently worked. <laughs> or it could be a small Italian. I wasn't still sure. <laughs> but, but, Nine months later, I got the call and I hopped in the plane the next day and went and, and just to kind of, this is a picture of Luke and Heather, and you can kind of see, she doesn't have much of her gear on now. She's kind of stripped down. Hair almost looks kind of a normal color. And that was Luke. This is Luke after he, he's one years old. So anyway, so, so I flew out there and it was really amazing. I, I showed up and I go in the hospital room and there's, I'd met Jimmy before, the little Italian guy, and there he is, and he had a ton of gear on him too, and there's this little baby on his lap. I'm looking at Jimmy with all his gear and his rings and tattoos, and there's this little white baby that apparently is mine, but it's kind of weird because I didn't grow up, I mean, he didn't grow with some pregnant woman next to me or something. It's like now I'm showing up to meet my baby. So there he is. And I, it was pretty weird for the first day or two because really they were bonded to the baby and I was sort of the visitor. And that was cool. I was, I was good with this because I still thought maybe Heather won't even give him up. I don't know. It's hard to say. So, and she had had to have a cesarean. So things were progressing kind of slowly. So we loaded up after a week in a mobile home, a motor home. So my doctor said, don't put a brand new baby in the winter in an airplane. So we loaded up a motorhome, drove across country, had a few more friends come out, so we had about eight of us in a motorhome traveling across country. And so Luke had his first cross country trip when he was seven days old to ten days old. And he arrived here and we got on I-80, and she lived about a block off I-80 there, and I lived about a mile off I-80 here. We traveled across the country, drove up my driveway, and she stuck around for a few days and and I learned a lot. We, I got to do my first diapers. I got to do my first bath with the baby. It was pretty cool. It was very cool. And I guess now that it's all said and done, I really feel a great sense of, of, of thankfulness or I don't know how to say how I feel about Heather, but she did me something that, yeah, I did pay her. She got paid quite a bit of money and I did, but, but but that was an amazing thing she did for me, out of the blue. She did this for me. And the risks she took are kind of amazing. I could have I could have ran off. She could have got a disease. I could have not paid her. I mean, she took immense risks with her own health and her own life to, to give me this kid. And then she gave it to me and flew away. I thought it was pretty amazing. So 
I think it's, it's an interesting story, this whole surrogate thing. And, and, it, and at 52, you can become a father, still. And, and it's been a wonderful thing. You can see a picture of Luke. He's doing well. He's seven now. He's in second grade. He's doing great. And I thought I'd share with you guys a little bit of the story of me and my surrogate son. Thank you.